Okay. So, are we okay to make a start, if that's all right? We're just sort of running to time. The door's remaining open because, as you can probably tell by the, the heat that's given off in there, I think the air mods give out. Um, so, um, it's a, a workshop on uh, growth in cooperatives. And what we mean by that is growth in terms of number of members, growth in terms of turnover, growth in terms of capital, growth in terms of uh, a whole sort of myriad of different things. Um, we've got three speakers uh, today. We've got, uh, we've got Martin from Unicorn Grocery in Charlton, which is a working co op, uh, one of the established clubs in the middle of years ago. 17, right. Um, working up to it then. And, um, and, and Unicorn Grocery has got a real, a real institution in that part of Manchester. We've got Jules Spencer from FC United, uh, he's a board director there, FC United. Have grown sort of fairly exponentially in uh, in the past. Uh, I will get this one right since they were formed in 2005. Got that one right. And uh, we've got David Button who uh, has, has been working with that, that agricultural cooperatives for I'm not going to say how many years actually for a number of years um, and has worked with organisations to help them grow and, and sort of expand and, and work in various variety of areas. I'm going to hand over to Jules first because you're under a bit of time pressure in there. So, uh, so Jules is just going to talk about FC United and how they've, uh, how they've uh, achieved growth recently. Thanks, Jess. Um, yeah, as Jess says, I'm uh, a board of directors of FC United Manchester, which um, if you don't know, is a uh, corporate football club uh, in Manchester, so the way the players take over. Um, we're um, uh, established in 2005 as, as an IPS. Um, we uh, participated in that uh, institution. We're a one member football, uh, football club. Um, we've grown quite quick, quickly as a football club over those seven years. Um, we have uh, in excess of 3,300 members, uh, which, for the size of uh, or the level of football that we're playing at, is. is um, um, it's an amazing figure. Um, we uh, regularly average 2,000 uh, every week at our attendances, um, and um, you know we can get anything up to six, seven thousand for some of the big game, games that we played uh, in our short history. Um, we currently tenants at Gig Lane in Bury. We don't have our own uh, our own ground. Um, clearly, at the time that we've been going, we've been able to um, get to that stage. So if you talk about Barry's of growth, and that's the main barrier to us, is, is getting our own football stadium. Um, and so we embarked on a mission to build our own ground probably about four years ago. Um, um, talking to Manchester City Council, we talked to Salford uh, and the likes to try and find a suitable plot. One was identified um, in Newton Heath in Manchester at 10 acres late, um, but unfortunately that was pulled. Um, in the round of um, local government cuts um, two years ago, but we're off the alternative side of Boston, uh, North East Manchester, um, which we hope to build um, our community facility there in hopefully the next 12 months. Clearly, as a fledgling football club, we haven't got huge reserves of cash um, to be able to simply find three and a half, four million, or five million, whatever it costs to build a football ground. So, a uh, main barrier to grow, if you like, was. was was finding that money. Um, we've been able to access grant funding for the Football Foundation and Sport England. Um, our supporters have raised around about £600,000 in cash in terms of donations, whether that be by putting on functions, um, putting money in buckets, um, a whole array of activity over the last three years or so has raised, um, as I say, just short £600,000 in cash. By our greatest achievement to date, um, and I'm sure Jeff will be able to answer some questions on this uh, if you have any, um, was the launch of the Community Share Scheme, um, which today has raised um, just over 1.7 million, 1.725 million, and is on target to reach 1.8 million um, over the next few months. And that's been achieved from a base of, as I say, around about 3,000 members. Um, it's about 1,400 people put into that scheme, um, of which around about 20-22% um, are new members. Um, so the people have come on board, seeing what we're able to do, seeing what, uh, 
established co-op. Um, we were established on quite radical principles in the sense that we were at the time, if not the only vegan supermarket, definitely the only one that dared to be larger than a corner shop and dared to aspire to be larger than a corner shop. And part of that context was that probably all of the founding members, including myself, had been radicalised during factorism. So during that whole kind of dire period when kind of a lot of structures were being stripped back. That's when we kind of gained our, I suppose, our conscience or our insights. So we were, a lot of us were coming from combative kind of activism, kind of after tax activism. And we were setting up a co-op, a workers' cooperative, in what actually now looks like a very mild recession, but at the time, in 96, was considered a recession. So it was considered to be setting up at an inappropriate time, setting up a co-op that we seem to be not viable. Uh, a bunch of ex-hippies wanting to only sell lentils, I think was going to be almost a local attitude. Uh, we, our initial capital was about 40,000, which was uh, drawn from ourselves. Uh, we didn't start off with a loan stock. We started off with a, what we call a lot of sweat labour. I would say that probably average working week for the first few years probably topped 60 hours per staff member. Uh, and that wasn't sustainable, to be honest. So I'm glad to say that now, 16, 17 years later, I'm not doing those type of hours anymore. Uh, we've kind of worn out by then. But it does indicate that so within a common, <coughs> particular worker culture, you actually go through different phases and the kind of radicalism and the sheer kind of brutal willpower to succeed or sustain yourself early on is not necessarily the staff base that you have as you enter into a kind of I would say as an organisation middle age, where we have a far more humane and varied staff. We're now kind of approaching 50 members of the co-op. Uh, I'm the last person from those founding kind of horse hair suit kind of days. Key moments in our growth was uh, often you happens in co-ops, it happens maybe in all kind of businesses, you either change or change is forced upon you. One of the key moments in our growth was that the warehouse which was attached to an office block on our site. The whole site was being kind of speculatively looked at from developers. Uh, the person who owned the site was just about to spend a couple of years at his uh, Majesty's pleasure, uh, Majesty's pleasure site, for tax evasion. And he was rapidly getting rid of all the assets that were in his wife's name before the amount of revenue could have got anything. So we were forced to a position where we actually had to undertake buying the building to make a rapid expansion and it also come in a rapid uptake in our perception of our own responsibilities. 
So that's when we did use loan stock. We managed to raise just under a million pounds, which at the time was petrifying. The idea that we had amongst 16 members at that time uh, a liability uh, which extended beyond the, the numbers, it extended to thinking that customers coming in has been shopping for the last few years, is prepared to put their savings into a workers' cooperative at the end of the day, is still not going to sell them cheese or eggs. There are many times they're like that in the communication where you can sell the cheese. So Since then, we've uh, decided that change should be something that we generate rather than necessarily a reactive thing. Reactive things can be good, and that was a very good reactive thing, but it's on the path that we still on. But we have also raised loan stock uh, to enable us to move into farming. And uh, we now have a small site, a new site, uh, on Wirral, which is being farmed by another cooperative, which is actually drawn from our existing members. Um, and that's part of our philosophy about sustainability, reducing the kind of food mileage, and also reflecting the fact that as an independent, as opposed to a kind of larger chain, we don't have, and we increasingly have less autonomy when it comes to things like haulages. As you probably, anybody reads the kind of back pages, the business pages, you'll, you'll see that there's a lot of consolidation of haulages at the moment, and there will possibly come a time when the independent sector will gravely struggle to be able to fairly compete against the multiples as they increasingly take over the supply chain in terms of also, in terms of vehicles, but also in terms of influence. Where we are at the present, uh, it seems we're still spending more money. We still seem to be <coughs> growing. Uh, but I think one of the things that's very important to us as a workers' cooperative is that through all of that growth, whilst we have used loan stock and we have used uh, sweat labour, uh, we've never been a subsidised organisation. It's quite important in terms of our philosophy as, as a worker cooperative that uh, whilst there are organisations which do require to exist, by seeking kind of government or government agency support, and there's those organisations that wouldn't exist without that. Uh, that we, as a, a workers' cooperative, uh, we survive through our tills. If our tills aren't rattling, we don't get paid. So everything that we do, our one percent fund, our four percent fund, uh, our kind of local commitments in terms of social activism, is based on the fact that we have to have a viable business. We don't seek to actually get funding from elsewhere to sustain our business. I've seen more opportunities in the question. Great, thanks. Thank you. Over to you, Joe. Good afternoon. Um, I'm David Button, as you mentioned, I'm also chair of COP UK, but my background in the last 37 years has been working with agricultural partners. That's very So my story is not going to be anywhere as new as interesting as the last two because they're about specific business. Um, so, so I'm going to track more on the generality of things and also look, look at the way that agriculture has moved. Now they've had to restructure in many cases, they've had to fund themselves differently because the way that industries changed over, started start in the 70s really. Uh, and basically the, the issues in those days was we had a lot of big British farmers who didn't feel the need necessarily to cooperate because they were big enough to supply the markets that they wanted. Uh, but as gradually the <coughs> encroachment, if you like, of the Dutch, and no offence to any other national by forest uh, the Dutch and the Spanish and the French, etc., um, who were able to produce large qualities of quality product at a stroke, I pick up the phone, so if I pick up the phone, it could be delivered. We suddenly found that the UK producers were losing you their market share. I need to speak up a bit because there's oh, sorry, you've got one raining on the roof. Right. 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 I'll use the microphone for you. I don't like these things. Is that any better? Yeah, Is that better? Yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I sit down then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's even better. It's getting better by the minute. Good. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so back in the 70s, we were starting to lose our market share, UK producers. Uh, and it became essential that farmers started to work together and, and in those days government provided funding to set up an organisation called the Central Council for Agriculture and Horticultural Cooperation. Just trips off the tongue there, Marlock. And, um, and basically uh, we were given money to provide not just grant aid but advice and guidance on providing the structures necessary to get farmers to work together. Originally the purpose was to uh, get more market focused. Um, so therefore, a lot of the early co-ops were set up to uh, really to just get product together. So say you were producing, I said, uh, a 
horticultural products, say top fruit, uh, you had a greater volume of top fruit which you could then market to supermarkets and other outlets. As time went on, <coughs> they were fairly simple, most of the groups acted as agents, in other words, they didn't take ownership of the product, they marketed the product on behalf of their members, took a levy for doing it. Uh, fairly low risk, risk averse businesses really. Um, and that's also applied to, to grain and, and many other products that were being produced by British farmers. As time went on and as the supermarkets got more and more powerful, it became obvious that we needed to improve the infrastructure in terms of cool chain, in terms of <coughs> facilities, in form of processing facilities, storage in particular with fruit. Um, and therefore the, the whole structure of those businesses needed to change. Now, um, in the main, the money has always been provided by three, three parts. One was either bank borrowing, one initially was from Grand A, and the, the third third uh, was from producers themselves. Now, it's quite interesting that we developed fairly early on um, rather than going down the share capital route, uh, we went down the route of generally one share per member. In other words, you bought a one pound share, which enabled you to, to be a member, etc. Uh, and then you provided qualification loans, as we called them, loans which enabled you to make use of the services. A lot of those loans, if I take a grain group as an example, uh, would be linked to the amount of tonnage that you wanted to store. So in other words, if I wanted to stand 50 tonnes, store 50 tonnes, or it would be 500 tonnes probably, let's say 50 tonnes, make it easy, um, I would <coughs> might pay 60 tonnes a tonne for the privilege. That would be in the form of a loan. If you wanted to put in 1,500, you'd pay 1,500 times 60 tonnes. So therefore, the business was very cooperative. In other words, you, you funded it according to your usage. Um, again, most of these were done as agents, and the money that was raised uh, to pay for the services, if there was any surplus, tend to talk surplus as opposed to profit, uh, because we're tax mutuals, so we don't pay tax um, by working in a particular way. Um, any surplus would either go back to members in relation to their throughput. So very cooperative. Um, the other key element was that to, to ensure that we had security, and the banks for their lending needed obviously security, and they were no different then than they are there. Um, we used what we called the members agreement to do that, because their members agreements in their co-ops set out quite clearly what the members' obligations are. They're legal contractual agreements. Uh, and therefore, if they said they were going to market all their tonnage through the group, or they were going to store their tonnage through the group, they signed it legally obligated. They couldn't be a member without. And if they failed to do that, they actually were then removed from membership. Um, so therefore, uh, it's a very key principle in most agricultural, almost all agricultural cults, that they are there for the user, they are there for the current user, uh, and therefore if you do not have a current member's agreement and use it, you're no longer a member. I think a key lesson we learned from that was from Ireland, from the dairy co-ops. When the dairy co-ops in Ireland were essentially privatised, sold from under the members who were actually using them, it was done because they'd not cleaned their registers. And they had more people on their register who were either dead, uh, had left milk or whatever, than the people actually producing milk. So they could make the decision on the actual business that you and I may be a member of and using it. So now we, if you take all the rules that we use in agriculture cops or articles, whatever, whichever legal structure we use, um, we, we have as a basis that unless you honour your members' agreements and continue to supply, you're no longer a member and you lose your voting rights immediately. So decisions can only be made by, by members. So raising capital, we did through qualification. In England, in Scotland, they tend to use share capital more than we do. We tend to use qualifications linked to the use of which you, you want to make the group. We did exactly the same in, in top group co-ops, in horticultural groups, and so grain groups particularly. But across the whole cooperative spectrum of, of co-ops, we've got to remember that members of agricultural co-ops are businesses in their own right. So they're very business focused. But I would argue very cooperatively minded. It's always one member, one vote. Um, everything goes back to them according to usage. Very strict regulations about who can be members, how you lose your membership. But raising of capital. We now come into a new era, really, when we're looking at the milk groups, of course, the amount of money needed to, to fund added value is extremely high. And you know, I'm not a pet, I try and be a realist. That's when you can start to hit problems because you then start to look for new novel ways of raising money. And if you start to bring outside influences, um, and I know you can do that, but if you start to bring in undue outdoor influences, then you can start to lose your cooperative ethos. You start to lose the basic principles of why you're there. And that's something we are very keen 
not from a um, philosophical point of view, but simply from a business point of view, we know that if producers are responsible for funding it, for using it, then the thing will succeed. The commitment of members has always been absolutely key. So nowhere near as exciting as our previous two, not individuals. But I think from the point of view of lessons to be learned in any corporate business, good sound business structures, good ways of raising money, member, real focus, member commitment. And that's the way that the agricultural cooperatives are formed. And that's why if you look at the sectors, we have 50 of the top 100 co-ops in the UK. You can tell I'm by. I'm chairman of the cops, as you guess. I love all cops. But I prefer the cops. Perhaps I like them. Anyway, that's right. Thanks very much. Well, I'm going to survive. I don't need a microphone all the with my love big brother. Um, it's just moving on now to uh, talk a little for some, uh, some uh, questions and answers, I suppose. <coughs> Jules has had to go from FC United, however, I've worked on the share issue, so if, you, if it is a case of any questions on that, I'm more than happy to answer them as I, as I may, but for Martin and David and myself. We've got quite a few people in the room who bring an additional skill set. Vivian's kindly joined us, and there's various other people from other cooperatives that are, that are just sort of looking around at some East England and others. Uh, Vivian's from the phone cooperative amongst many, many others who've also got in the past decade experience quite a, a high rate of growth and, uh, in, and, and it's very interesting the different methodologies that have been used, for example, with Unicorn not particularly wanting to distill their worker ownership, so thereby not offering shares but offering loans because there's, sort of, there's support but without seeding control. Uh, however, FC United have um, a huge membership on which to draw who could become investors as well as members, members first, investors second. So it's two different, two quite different approaches there, and a blended approach in the agriculturals which use a mixture of these uh, these types of approaches. So, uh, hand it over to you if there's any questions and answers, and if I could uh, point them in the right direction. Great, we had a question from over here, and then we've yeah. got one from Vivian. Sorry, I just wanted, with the very greatest of respect, to disagree with you on the other right. things, uh, because good. I think there's a real danger. I'm doing a master's in food policy at the moment, and it's uh, it's mind blowing. I mean, I thought I knew something about food, and now I've been in this course, and I've realised that now I know something about food. Um, but I think there are some real, real areas of caution, particularly food co-ops. I, I don't really agree that the right way is to try and match these giants. Everything about the true cost of food is not about the industrialisation and process we've got almost to the last letter, I would say. And I think it's really, I think what we, what I would like to see the cooperative movement do is much more of what you were talking about in the previous one and, and one this morning, which is much more networking and cooperation within cooperatives yeah. and within so between it's... cooperatives. I think there's a huge amount of uh, potential in that. And I think, unfortunately with food, it goes right back to the soil. And if, if, if you've got the soil not good, you've got health not good, you've got all sorts of other things, and everything about the, the huge multinational supermarket model is wrong in that respect. Which would be interesting to get your thoughts on that, Martin. Bear in mind, Unicorn have now actually raised the lowest stocking part to, to have their own uh, farm uh, produce a their own yeah. arable we, land. We, we also, by default, have a market garden with fairly strong outcomes. Be a merchant's market garden. If you remember, probably up until about the 1950s, there were actually market gardens virtually all the way around Manchester. And that wasn't <coughs> ideological or ethical, uh, simply because that was a viable, sustainable one. And other cities. And other cities, I mean, just use Manchester. Yeah. I think there's a, I mean, we don't have the option, option as a multiple to have to be engaged with the scale of buying that might be. By uh, the discount, we don't have that option. So, so in some ways, we don't address that at all. Uh, what we do want to address that is those kind of uh, interproducer relationships, and where we often make inroads is that actually personal relationships develop with, with suppliers, growers, can build trust over a period of time, and can build a strong base. We, we have things that we can't count on. We can't count on the fact that. Tesco's tomorrow open for a marketing campaign and tell loads of lies and say they're the cheapest in the country and all we can do is work on our blackboard that our organic carrots are more cheaper than, than non-organic carrots. We don't have that base to, to publicise that, but we, we're used to that. We're used to the idea that you know, one of the powers of the multiple system is a huge amount of disinformation. Thank you. 
Thanks. There was a question from Vivian. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I suppose um, I'm intrigued in a little way that if this is that this is a broadly about how to grow a car, uh, and yet all the conversation pretty much has been about capital. And um, I'm actually not sure that that is the the, main, the, the biggest issue. It is an issue facing um, co-ops that want to grow. Um, I think it's about how we run the business, how we scale it, how we market our products. Um, and, you know, the phone co-op, as you said, has grown over the last year. We have grown every year. But I, I sort of think, well, if, that, if, if it's true that we're one of the fastest growing ones, it worries me about the rest of the company because, because, you know, I sit there and I think, oh, we've only got another 160 customers this month, and that's actually not very many. And we lost nearly as many, and the growth has come through selling more to the same customers, but whatever. But it's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not just capital. And I think often there is also a, a misunderstanding of what the, the true problem is. If, if it's not possible for an organisation that needs capital to raise it, that's possibly because it isn't financially successful enough, commercially successful enough to, to justify uh, investment. Um, I completely support the idea that we should look to members for investment, um, but I think we have to do that in a way that is responsible. We have to be completely transparent with members about what, what, are, what risks we're asking them to take. Um, some of the community share issues I see worry me a little bit because I think it is bordering on <coughs> uh, and maybe the members don't understand that. And, uh, but yeah. that's a whole other discussion. That is, that's one, <laughs> one we'll pick up on tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, so bordering on what, did you say? On, on asking them for a gift. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, and so I think, you know, when we call it, it may be that, that the chances of them actually being able to get that money back within a, when they need it are, are quite slim. And that, and that may not be apparent to the member at the time. Yeah, I, I think there's, there, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of the share issues by ethical PLCs essentially look like that as well, don't they? Because you're buying a transferable share, but in reality, Who's going to buy no it? one's ever going to take off your hands. So it's more of about, I suppose it's the way you approach investment. Quite right, I mean, we've been talking about capital a lot in this as well, and I think we, but we didn't talk about Unicorn growing from a couple of members to 50 members of staff, and FC United growing to a 3,000 yes. membership base. So mem membership and talking about growth is, is certainly more about capital and cooperatives. It's about, about reinvestment, it's about members, it's about sort of growth in a variety of different ways. Shameless plug, I keep doing this in every workshop. Um, on the uh, homepage of Cooperatives UK, uk.coop, there's on the right hand side, there's Grow a Cooperative, and we've got three case studies, one being Unicorn, one being FC United, and one being the uh, Edinburgh Bicycle Corp. And all of them talk about growth in, in the more holistic sense, about how they've grown their members, uh, how, you know, how they've uh, reinvested in the business, and the, the various other things they've done to grow a successful business operating uh, cooperatively. Uh, David, you had a comment. Just, just, just go back to view. First of all, I should say that as a member of the phone call, with the new name, sorry, the, the Cooperative Phone and Broadband is on. That's it. Um, so if you join a fifty pound a year and a small telephone bill, you're interested. Um, That's so a good shameless plug. That's a really good shameless plug. I do it simply because it's true. And, uh, anyway, I'll have done it. You can stay as before. chair. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's another vote. Okay. Um, no, I, I take the point. I mean, I, we've talked about capital. Certainly in the uh, agriculture, I've certainly done more capital. But basically, I've never been down on a project that was worthy of support but couldn't get the capital. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the businesses that say we can't get um, women in, cannot get the capital to grow, are uh, simply because they're not good enough people. They're not good enough businesses. Mm. Uh, <coughs> um, most of our growth has tended to, to come by, uh, I have to say, by um, natural growth of the individual producers. They've got bigger or whatever. Amalgamation of farm businesses of course, in this country has been considerable, and therefore somebody buys another farm and they join them. Go on. In the main, most of our groups have of uh, grown by um, merger or transfer of the if you use a society term. Um, they tend to grow in that way. Um, I come from the background that uh, changes no problem saying it. Properties are business enterprises like any other business. The moment you forget that you're a business, you'll do. Because uh, and I think I mentioned proven I hate the term not for profit, everything's for profit. It's what we do with it counts. Uh, and I so uh, that's an app one I should say. I'm thinking of myself now, rather than this big copy. Um, but I absolutely, you know, we have to be business focused because nobody owes us a living unless we're able to compete, unless we're able to produce what our customers want, what our members want, produce member benefit, all of those things, we will be dead in the water. I can remember when I was at Food and Britain, we used to do a lot of research into, well, sourcing really, 
but um, one of the things is looked at a research into um, people what people's buying habits were in supermarkets, buying Britain. And if you interviewed most people going into the supermarket and said, do you buy British? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you look for British? Yeah. When you came, they came out and you checked their shopping basket, which we did, not all. The majority had bought on price. Yeah. Now, that was rather sad, actually, uh, because we thought we were doing a good job promoting British food and all those sort of things. This is an but international I mean, conference day. Sorry? This is an international conference day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so although you know, people, I think in all honesty, do believe that that's what they do, in reality, we're all driven by different things. Right. And certainly in the economic climate at the moment, um, people will buy and price. I remember an argument, no, no, disagreement probably, with Norwich District Council, one of the council members. And I sat there and he started to tell me that, um, well, of course, everybody should buy organic. And everybody should buy this and not buy that. But everybody should do that. I said, well, not everybody can do that. He said, well, if they learn to cook, they'd all be all right, you see. And I, I didn't hit him. I could have done. But, you know, so I think we have to be very careful. And one of the problems sometimes, and so I'm getting myself into deep water now, sometimes I go to conferences, not this one, but I have been, where you've got people who can afford to do all these things, preaching what everybody else should do. And as a cooperator, and I come from, I, I did 10 years in Eastern Europe working in some of the poorest communities on this planet. And it's no good telling them that they need to, to do this and do that. They just want to survive. There's an old saying, I, I can't use the term I would normally use with a group of farmers, but it's very difficult to, it? it's very difficult to think about draining the swamp when an alligator is biting your bottom. I could use a more <laughs> agricultural terminology. But I think it's very, we, we just have to be careful sometimes. But I agree, growth is different, but we do live in a global market. Uh, and But there is all the time we've got people like Unicorn and others keeping us on our toes and, and doing that way. And of course, the independent group and group, uh, that's good. But I think we just have to realise that we are in competition with it. Uh, we cannot just throw everything out for it. Anyway, try to say that. No, no, no. Oh, I just wanted to offer a comment um, about public perception profiling and in Australia. At, Think Tank, the Australian Institute published a paper last week entitled Who Knew Australians Were So Cooperative and found doing some research this cognitive dissonance between um, co members being members of co-ops but not knowing the consequences of that or yeah. their entitlement or their, their place in the, in the market. Yep. That's great, thank you. Can I just make just a comment to the name because I wasn't, um, I, I don't believe either or. I mean, I, in our society, we practice both because we're middle sized. So we got an initiative with the seasonal food bought locally. Um, and what we do is we say to the, a farmer or a craft baker or something, do you want to put your stuff in our shops? And if you do, do you want to put them in the, put them in the store nearest? We don't do like the Tesco's and that say, trunk it out the road at your expense. And what they do to, to the people is they say, we're promoting your chickens next week. That's going to cost you that. Ethics with the movement comes from saying, well, yeah, we're big compared to you, but we're actually want to be partners. Yeah. And it is about partnership, but we can't use our strength of our size if we're being overpowered by other people. We've got to, at some time, at some place, be aware of price and say, we've got the cooperative difference, but we've also got to be able to feed people who can't afford to pay as much. Well, I think there's a vision for the bigness being achieved by several people who are best equipped and perhaps most local getting together to do that because I don't Well that's think it. That's that's what that is called. That different, is principle six. Yeah. That's, and that's and that's a different what, model from that, that was what the, the the only distinction if, I was making yeah. is that, that there's a danger if you go with their model of it. If well if we do need the size to equalise, that may be true. With the, but I would hate for it to be on a principle that must by its very nature start losing some of the principles you need to stick no. with. 
food, that's the... I don't think you need to. I think that within the co-op, the, the one thing that's been set successful about 150 years of cooperation, it's been someone's always been able to find a way to maintain the principles and go on. And you look around the world, a lot of places around the world, where they, she always say, historically, maybe they co up something from America, and some of the states where historically, they've been very big in housing. They've, they've done housing and they've, they've done it well. But over in this country, we've not been able to match that because we haven't had but we, we are very good at shops. Big problem was, after the war, we said up oh, 60% of the market's enough. Yes. And now we've got 6%. And that's, that's the problem. Because in life, if you're not going forward, you're going back. And it's nothing to do with wanting to, you know, wanting to be vicious and snatch the market off. It's, it's, it's the fact that you have to. Okay. Thanks very much. That's, that's very, very interesting. Um, has anyone got anything else they'd like to ask any of the panelists, or anything, anything they'd like to add to the corner of our discussion? What have the knowledge I've heard talked about most people so far? So that's just a very basic question to yourself, which is when you started with Unicorn, how many people were cooperators wanting to develop a co-op, and how many were retailers? And as the business has grown, have you had to bring in retailers with an empathetic and sympathetic interest, or have you stayed very focused on the cooperative side. I'm talking about people running the business, not the membership, not etc. Well, great question. The, the membership is, is purely the, the people that run the business. We, we don't have any shareholders. Right. You buy one share as a director, and you are a director. Right. So when I go back on the cleaning the toilets, picking some shelves, and I'm still a director, so I still have to worry about the spreadsheet. So I treat me like I'm standing at the time. <laughs> the founding members we had. One priest who has gone on to try to find a number of cop, and we had one person who was working for a cop that we set up, which was a second cop in about 2000, who was a downfall. All the rest, none of them have ever returned experience. A uh, couple of them, I would even say, probably didn't even have work experience. Uh, and since then, um, we've had some interesting conversations with people that would propose themselves to be experts in retail and they probably are but it's a bit like when you speak to somebody from the NHS if you're uh, running something that's ad hoc that they don't necessarily understand that, that you can find complex solutions that doesn't have a diagram that preceded it and often when you talk to kind of retail analysis you know, specialists and you read the grocer magazine you, you, you're often talking to people that are kind of like reached dramatically for their, their diagram. It may be a brilliant diagram, maybe lots of years of research. But, and in a sense, we could probably, in hindsight, make some nice diagrams that make us look really good in the profession. But um, I think there's been a huge amount of the start of sweat labor. There's been a huge amount of saying, okay, what is someone's potential? As we could perceive it, we might get it wrong. How do we create that potential? So, like, we've had people that have come in that are no more experienced than I am, who have no, subsequently trained in HR, subsequently trained in kind of finances. We've, we've had people that have trained up that, that we've lost because they've taken their qualification and, and ran. As you can imagine, if you pay them a lot, huge amount of money and you, you go to say there's going to be no pay buys, it's flat rate, you're going to be paying the same much as that person you detest, then you might lose people. But we, we have that kind of best, we have that kind of open structure where we try to take people from where they are. Um, I think if I applied, I was talking to some people in the counters today, if I applied for a job at the co-op, I probably wouldn't get it. Uh, he was asking me about blah, 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 and I said, no, I haven't got that qualification. No, I haven't got that. And they go, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I do contractual employment. Uh, I do some HR functions. I, I used to be sorts of products. Uh, clean the toilets and I can drive a forklift and I can certainly with the till and they kind of didn't know where to put that because I couldn't walk into their white collar and I was overqualified or disqualified so it's kind of it, the difference <coughs> co-ops is moving work co-ops is moving from very inorganic 
where everything is highly personal, and personal, and you can kind of get lots of descriptions to something that's more inorganic and structured, and you can drop into those structures, and that's that, whilst maintaining consensus and principles. Quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a yes, I can recommend everybody does it. I mean, I would say, take your stores and turn them into individual work co ops. Yeah. Build a trading group. Interestingly, one of the retail societies has done that in, in recent years with um, the Angling uh, set up a work co op, have they, for their home furnishings department? Is that what yeah, they were getting out of furniture. So. So, yeah, I was just going to comment on that because, uh, yeah, I mean, in the phone co op, when it started, everybody did <coughs> everything. Um, you know, we could all answer the phone, we could all set up new accounts, we could all organise the billing, etc. But very quickly, obviously, we had to specialise, and I think we went to the point of specialisation, we took specialisation too far and we've actually had to learn to multi-skill back. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, you don't have one group of people who talk to customers, another group of people who enter data. We now have people going back and forth between those things and we can respond to changes in, in demand and so forth. And we're beginning to now think, well, actually, we really want people to be a bit more, you know, they might have spend some time in finance rather than just doing uh, those things. So actually, we've kind of gone back to that. And it, it is interesting, you know, um, as a business grows, you have different pressures on you to do different things, and, and you um, you evolve through that. And it's, it's actually, I think, part of the trick is where we've perhaps made mistakes in the past is not seeing that soon enough and not adapting fast enough to, to those changes. But of course you can. Yeah, I was just going to say it's a really. I mean, Unicorn is a as a as a case study. We do them to death as a case study because they're such an you know an enlightening and uplifting. Case study, and it is great. You know, it's really in terms of growth and the growth of people's skills is something that that work co-ops, very debt work co-ops, are great at. And, you know, and that's something I think the industry generally could definitely look at work co-ops and see how do you develop people, how do you grow people. Sorry, we've got one very quick question. Well, uh, just a very quick observation going back to your point there. I think also there's an element of I don't think in this country we're that ready sometimes. We're a bit hierarchical, and we don't recognise the rules of courses. That I did a survey online a couple of days ago which was asking about the devolution of council over councils. There were several questions that said, do you think open councils should? And I was sort of, having worked in the GRC in Ilia, I, there were very, very good things that, that were rubbish to divide up between inter, inter localized situations, whereas there were other things that it was very good to put to yeah. back right along. And I don't think we're terribly good necessarily at doing that generally. I think we. we don't sometimes get the management bases that will work and we're not prepared to run with things if they don't begin to sit with our model and Great. Well, mutualisation of public services is probably a different workshop as well, I'd say, and probably one we haven't got time left to answer in 30 seconds adequately. Uh, we're wrapping up now, Paul. Right, sorry, I'm going to have the red card. Uh, that's me. Thanks for your contribution, so thanks very much for if we could give a round of applause to the speakers. Thanks also for your contribution.